Hello and welcome to episode 107 of the How to Survive podcast. This week, The Wicker Man, in a movie in which a police sergeant is sent to a Scottish island village in search of a missing girl, whom the townsfolk claim never existed. Stranger still are the rites that take place there. Stranger still is Chris Morris, who joins me today. Hello. Hi. Much has been said of the strumpets of yore, of wenches and bawdy house queens by the score, but I sing of the baggage that we all adore. Chris Morris. Oh, his lips are as rose, and his wine is a treat. His whiskey is good, and his figure is neat. And while he's serving his bitter, he's sweet. Chris Morris. You'll never love another, although he's not the kind of boy, to take home to your mother. His ale, it is lively and strong to the taste. It is brewed with discretion and never with haste. You could have all you like if you swear not to waste. Chris Morris. And when his name is mentioned, the pants of every gentleman do stand up at attention. Now there's Jane of the Blossom and Doll of the Crown, pretty Kate of the Garter and Star down in town, fat Dolly who keeps the red heart of renown. But I'll take Chris Morris. Oh, nothing can delight so, as does the part that lies between his left toe and his right toe. Chris Morris? You've gotten into a terrible habit of uh, copying and pasting long passages of text yeah. and then just reading them out. <laughs> Is that a bad habit or a good one? Well, that's for the listeners to decide. Email in, how does a live show at gmail.com. This week, The Wicker Man, 1973's Wicker Man. Mm-hmm. Not the uh, 1974's version. <laughs> or the remake starring Nicolas Cage. No, definitely not the no. Uh, that film. So, Chris, The Wicker Man is available on Amazon to rent. Mm-hmm. And it's worth it. It's an excellent film. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it is uh, an all-time classic. Unfortunately, uh, spoiled by the uh, cultural significance of itself. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get into the, the spoilers that lay in itself yes. in a little while. Um, but in the meantime, something wicker this way comes. Nice. And it's time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood. to investigate the disappearance of a young girl. Where is Rowan Morrison? If Rowan Morrison existed, we would know. I suspect murder. But, Sergeant, I've already told... In the name of God, woman, what kind of mother are you that can stand by and see your own child slaughtered? You are the fool, Mr. Harry. You're liars. Our despicable little liars. Sergeant Howie of the Highland Police travels to Summer Isle, a remote Hebridean island. He travels there of his own free will to investigate the reported disappearance of a young girl, Rowan Morrison. When he lands, he meets the island's harbour master and his cronies, who all claim no knowledge of Rowan, and generally act as if they don't take kindly to Sergeant Howie types around here. The group, who were all well into their 70s, point Howie in the direction of May Morrison's post office. May Morrison is reported to be the mother of the missing Rowan. But upon arrival, May Morrison and her daughter Myrtle report no knowledge of Rowan. Myrtle almost lets her guard down, claiming that Rowan is the name of a hare who lives in the meadow. Who sorts out the clothes for those animals? Hares. Go on. The hairdresser. <laughs> Sergeant, <laughs> I can't believe you didn't get that. Sergeant Howie leaves vexed and furious. Yeah. Howie checks into a local pub where the locals sing a song about the landlord's daughter. The landlord is Alder McGregory and his daughter is Willow. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the landlord is Alder McGregory and his daughter is younger McGregory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a. You want to know, I see I'm laughing at your jokes. You yeah. gave me nothing last week. Well, 
I gave you what you deserved. <laughs> Sergeant Howie is vexed and furious at all the singing in the pub and demands his dinner. When the dinner arrives, he is vexed and furious <laughs> that it is out of a can. Yeah. Willow explains that the island exported all of its harvest last year, hmm. but a photograph of the past year's harvest is missing from the wall. Interesting. And Sergeant Howie, vexed and furious, decides to take an evening stroll. Hmm. Around the village... He is vexed and furious to find everyone under the age of 90 engaged in full intercourse yeah. right there on the village green. When you say around the village, he walks like 10 yards out of the <laughs> pub and turns back in disgust immediately. Yeah. yeah. But they, I mean, it's not like they're just making out. They are they're really going, for it, going yeah. for it. Yeah. That night, outside of his window, a man who we later learn is Lord Summerisle brings another young man to have sex with Willow. The two have sex loudly causing an already vexed Sergeant Howie to become furious. The next day, Howie visits the local school. He is vexed and furious to learn that the young girls at the school are learning about reproduction and the semiotics of sexual imagery. He berates the teacher and demands that to see the school register. Despite the entire town claiming no knowledge of Rowan... Mor Rowan? Rowan. Despite, despite the entire town claiming no knowledge of Rowan Morrison... How he finds her name in the register. The school teacher explains that Rowan died and that her body is now in what was once the churchyard. She explains that Christianity is not taught on Summer Isle and instead the old gods of nature and fertility are worshipped. Naturally, Sergeant Howie is vexed and furious. Of course. Howie walks to the churchyard and finds an unmarked grave. The grave digger tells him it belongs to Rowan. And the grave has a strange adornment, which the gravedigger explains is Rowan's umbilical cord. Because where else would it go? Yeah. After visiting the records office and finding no death certificate for Rowan, a pursuit which leaves Sergeant Howie feeling vexed and furious, mm -hmm. he heads to meet Lord Summerisle and to get to the bottom of what's really going on. Around the town, May Day celebrations are in full swing, with songs about fertility abounding, and a group of naked women jumping over a campfire chanting songs to encourage the fire to make them fertile. Lord Summerisle asks Sergeant Howie if he is refreshed by the youth. Good afternoon, Sergeant Howie. I trust the sight of the young people refreshes you. No, sir. It does not refresh me. Oh, I'm sorry. And so the history of Summerisle is spelled out. Lord Summerisle's grandfather drove the Christians out after demonstrating that pagan rituals lead to a better harvest each year. Sergeant Howie is not impressed and demands permission to exhume Rowan's body, which Lord Summerisle grants. Upon exhuming her body, Howie discovers a dead hare in the coffin with no body. Vexed and confused, he takes up the matter with Lord Summerisle, who is wistful and evasive on the matter. Visiting the town library, Howie looks up May Day celebrations and finds that traditions dictate a procession through the town with three key characters. One is a horse which attacks the young girls in the village. One is Mr. Punch, a fool, who is king for the day. And one is a weird cross-dressing hippie type, as you put it earlier, uh, vexing and infuriating for everyone. Yeah. Howie decides that the next day he will make for the mainland and return with more officers to charge the islanders with murder, but not before spending the night humping a wall, having been driven into a sexual frenzy by Willow McGregor singing. The next day, Howie finds his seaplane won't start, and so returns to the pub for a nap. Older and younger McGregor, uh, that's Willow, try to knock him out by burning some kind of chemical in his room, but Howie is wise to it and instead knocks out Alder McGregor. He steals McGregor's punch costume and attempts to infiltrate the village parade, convinced that Rowan is... Rowan? <laughs> Rowan. Convinced now that Rowan is alive and that she's going to be sacrificed by the crazed villagers. After a variety of bizarre rituals, Ro Rowan is led out to a promontory above the village. Howie runs up to untie her, and she leads him to safety through a series of caves. On the other side, she reveals it was a double cross, and Howie is vexed and infuriated to learn that there will be a sacrifice, but it won't be Rowan, it will be him, because he satisfies the old god's four rules for sacrifice. Number one, someone who has come of their own free will. Number two, someone who has the power of a king. Uh, in this case, the power of the king being the law. Number three, someone who is a virgin. Number four, someone who is a fool. 
Howie tries to explain that it won't work because he's a Christian. But Lord Summerisle is quick to point out that a martyr makes an even better sacrifice and that they mustn't be late for Howie's appointment with the wicker man. Howie is dragged and then carried to a cliff edge where there stands a giant wicker colossus filled with animals with a cage in the middle big enough for a man of Sergeant Howie's build. Sergeant Howie is vexed and furious as the wicker man is set ablaze and he is killed despite singing hymns and praying. And that's the end of Sergeant Howie. And that's the end of The Wicker Man. Yeah. So what did you think of The Wicker Man? Um, the first time I watched it was uh, a few years ago now, five years ago maybe. Um, and uh, I watched it with a few friends and um, it didn't have the impact that maybe it could have done because of the, the environment in which I was watching it. So, you mm. know, like people picking at it and, you know, it's very weird especially the first third of the film. Yeah. Um, lots of nudity, lots of singing and uh, just strangeness. Um, and I think watching it again on my own with a bit more of an atmosphere uh, is much more of an effective film. Yeah. And uh, the sort of weirdness of it is less funny and more sort of sinister. Yeah, it's all a bit... I don't know. Unsettling. Yeah, maybe. exactly. Because yeah. it's like... There's people doing things that are so socially abnormal that it's like, and particularly for a man who's a, a deep Christian. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, considered by many to be like a sort of uh, benchmark in uh, British horror yeah. or horror generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly an iconic film. It's considered the Citizen Kane of horror movies by uh, Cinefantastique. And um, it's pretty much like the definition of, I think, of a cult classic, so oh, to speak. A cult classic. Yeah. Is that what the joke you're making? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, I said, so to speak. Right. As you went, a cult. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll make that joke. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's um, I think it's a very, very good film. Um, I think to see it at the time would have been incredible because, yeah. um, you know, it would have been an incredible ending twist to see fresh. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately nowadays its impact is marred by the fact that the film has a sort of such a weight of cultural significance and also the title and also any artwork that's ever associated with the film is a giant burning wicker man yeah. with Christopher Lee stood in front of it going praise the, the summer god or whatever yeah. it is he says um, so like to imagine seeing it without all of that weight of knowledge yeah um, it would have been amazing. I saw it about 10 years ago. And the reason I knew the end is because, you know, Channel 4 used to do like the Trump 50 horror yeah, movie yeah, twist. Yeah, of course. I remember yeah. seeing it on that. And I th it was some Mark Lamar probably going like, my thing is right at the end, oh, you, it's crazy, isn't it? Because they burn him. And they, they show the scene. And yeah. Like, oh, oh, God. I was expecting the police to go come over the, the horizon and chop us. But no, they don't. They don't yeah. come. And he's yeah. like, well... No one's really expecting that, are they, Mark Lamar? No. I'm probably besmirching Mark Lamar. Probably yeah. wasn't <laughs> Yeah. No, I know what you... Yeah. It's it's a... Um, but, I mean, like, what did you think of it? Yeah, well, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's excellent. Uh, it's very moody. Uh, very atmospheric. Yeah. It's quite arch as well, isn't it? It's yeah. weird. Like, it's yeah. very strange. Arch is, arch is a good word to describe Christopher Lee in particular. Yeah. Like, the performances are, like, amazing. Yeah. Uh those two in particular, the two leading men. And, uh, but all, like all the way through, like Willow, when she's like singing and dancing, like yeah. her like weird coquettish. Yeah, she was song. dubbed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but the, because um, it was Britt Eklund, was yeah. it? Her, her Britt, Britt Eklund is, yeah. The, the body. Yeah. Yeah. But not the full naked body because she was pregnant. Yeah. Um, and then like, you know, even the, the songs about like the Maypole and stuff. Yeah. Like it's all just, um, just weird, isn't it? It's just like, Weird in a sort of silly, sinister way. Yeah. You yeah. don't, yeah. But I think the the fact that you've got such a strong, like, cipher for normality in yeah. Sergeant Howie. But he's but he, even he, he's not normal, is he? He's he, like, he takes it to, like, the opposite. It's, like, yeah. extremes. You've got... There's a part of us all that wants to be, like, you know, go and live in the woods. Mm. And there's a part of us all that's, like, that's fucking creepy. Yeah. Like, what the fuck are you up to? Yeah. And they're just like polarized. Yeah. It's a very difficult, uh, I think watching it in 2017, mm. it's difficult to watch because like, you know, 
you, you uh, like I think in 1970s it probably uh, felt like it was more obviously wrong from the get go, like the whole situation. Um, like, but nowadays, as as the sort of liberal wanker that that you and I are, yeah. Um, you sit and watching it and think, well, you know, like sex education is very important. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a bit of amicable drinking. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, consenting adults may do as, as they wish. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's probably like harder to be suspicious of like native cultures than it was back then. And, you know, if if Howie was, I guess what I'm saying is, if Howie was a liberal media wanker, yeah. then like like we are, then uh, you know he'd have had even more trouble seeing the truth. Yeah, I agree. But he's not. <laughs> he's yeah. He's, a fucking, he's an angry man. <laughs> he is. He's like such a like an anal retentive. I guess you might say. Um, he's not got any of the airs and graces that uh, British people typically have. No. That's Especially correct. when it comes to criticizing the food that you served. Yeah. This is what is it? It's disgusting. This is disgusting. Yeah. Food should have colour. No, sir. It does not refresh me. Oh, sorry. Every scene is just like the worst thing that he's ever seen yeah, in his life. Exactly. Like when the the school kids are all like, Oh, we don't know who Rowan is. And he finds a name in the register and slams it shut and goes, you are despicable little liars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then yeah. he opens a desk and for some reason they've got a beetle, which is yeah. sort of doing his own maypole ritual. Why on earth would you do <laughs> that? <laughs> the poor old thing keeps going on. Poor old thing. Then why in God's name would you do it, girl? Edward Woodward there. Yeah. Uh, do you know why Edward Woodward has so many D's in his name? Um... Because otherwise it'd be e woo woo woo. E wa woo wa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you call a man with a plank on his head? Woody. Edward. What do you call a man with two planks on his head? Edward Wood. What do you call a man with three planks on his head? <laughs> Edward Wood. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the wicker man. <laughs> yeah, uh, more than a few planks on his head at the end of the film, Joe. I dare say. Christopher Lee, similarly, mm-hmm. having a great time. Playing the most arch man who ever lived. Yeah. Everything he says is like, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just be animals? For, he uh, he um, d- played the role for free as well. Yeah. Like, like just had the, just did it for the fun of it. I watched like, um, Mark Kermo's documentary about The Wicker Man. Right. And like everyone is saying, like, the reason he did it for free is because he'd been typecast as Count Dracula. <laughs> like, yeah. He couldn't get any other roles. So he was like, I fucking need to do something. Uh, hippie, hippie Count Dracula. <laughs> Right. But he had the best line in maybe any movie ever, which I'm just waiting for the chance to use, which is, do sit down, Sergeant. Shocks are so much better absorbed with the knees bent. Yeah. He is, he is very good. All the cast are very good. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. But apparently, Rod Stewart tried to ban the film. Yeah, because he was dating <laughs> Britt Eklund. Yeah. Right? yeah. That is like reverse her revenge bum, porn, isn't it? And her like, bum is in it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, get off. You thought Rod Stewart would, you know, be all right with yeah. the, like. You know, copious amounts of nudity and everything. No, well, the mod apparently a bit of a prude. Yeah, <laughs> rude the prude. <laughs> yeah. So not much, uh, not much between this and a full musical, is there really? No, definitely not for the first act. Uh, it's pretty um, sing along. Yeah, the, the when he's flying his plane in, it sounds like uh, the song that's playing is like corn rigs and barley rigs, right? Which sounds like it's trying to be like a rock ballad. But the only instruments they had were like pan flutes and yeah. maracas. So you end up with this like, like the <laughs> it crescendo. So like, and corn rigs and barley rigs. Yeah. Corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs are bonny. I'll not forget that happy night among the rigs with us. Yeah, it's a, it's an odd one. Like the, first, the the number of songs that are in the first like quarter of the film. There's that. There's the uh, as you mentioned, the landlord's daughter, yeah. which is weird. Like I know it's supposed to be like, oh, isn't how he approved sort of thing. Yeah, but also it is weird. Like yeah. it's it's very it's strange. Fifty men sh- shouting about, about how much they love shagging the landlord's daughter. Yeah, while she dances around them. Yeah, very. Odd. And then uh, 
the maypole. Um, yeah, and from that tree there was a seed, and from that seed there was a man, and yeah. from that man there was a child, and from that child there was a man, and from that man there was a dead man. <laughs> from that tree there was a limb, and on that limb there was a branch, and on that branch there was a nest, and in that nest there was a egg, in that egg there was a bird, and from that bird a feather came, and all the Yeah. Um, so these are the three main songs I identified, and I've got the lyrics here. Mm -hmm. So this is this this is what they decided for the the seduction song, Willow's song, as it's called. Hey ho, who is there? No one but me, my dear. Please come say how do. These things I'll give to you. It goes on like that for some time. Then it says, Would you have a wondrous sight? The midday sun at midnight, fair maid, white and red, comb you smooth and stroke your head. How a maid can milk a bull, and every stroke a bucketful. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a turn there, doesn't it? Yeah. That that's like that's drives. like in the nineteen sixties where they used to play like uh, the uh, the undertones on yeah. uh, top of the pops, and like halfway through they'd go, "Oh my god!" and like rip the <laughs> record off because they'd realise it was about like fucking or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's that that's those those lyrics though. Send the sergeant Howie into a frenzy, and he starts yeah. making out with a wall. Yeah, very yeah. strange. I, I want to come back to that later. Right. So does he. Gently Johnny is the next one. This is a love song. Uh, when when uh, Old Willow's sleeping with that young boy. Right. The lyrics are, I put my hand on her knee. And she says, do you want to see? I put my hand on her breast. What do you think the next line is? You have passed the test. <laughs> and she says, do you want a kiss? Mm, that was good. I put my hand on her thigh. What did she say? Um, do you want to cry? Do you want to try? And finally, I put my hand on her belly. And she says, do you want to fill me? <laughs> <laughs> gently, Johnny, gently, Jolly, gently, Johnny, my jiggle. That's uh, Gently Johnny, a love okay. song. Finally, the climactic moment in the film, mm -hmm. when the horror has been wrought large. Yeah. Edward Woodward is being burnt alive. Yeah. This is what they <laughs> decide to go with. Summer is coming in. Loudly sing, cuckoo. Grows the seeds and blows the med. And springs the wood anew. Sing, cuckoo. You bleats harshly after lamb. Cows after calves make moo. Bullock stamps and deer's champs. Now shrilly sing cuckoo. Cuckoo, cuckoo, what bird are you? Be never still, cuckoo. There you go. While, all the while, a man's like, Ah, Jesus Christ! Ah, Jesus! Oh, God! Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, Jesus Christ! My God, Jesus Christ! Oh, God! Oh, Jesus Christ! So, Chris... I want to give you my top 10 signs that you're in a pagan cult. Okay. Uh, and we'll do that after this. This episode of How to Survive is sponsored by Mr. T Luxury Tees, who bring you this week's piece of useless IMDb trivia. This week's film is The Wicker Man. Although the film is set in May, it was filmed in October, November 1972. That fact might not be worth knowing, but Mr. T certainly is. Head over to Mr. T Luxury Teas to choose from a wide range of traditional, herbal and fruit teas from all over the world, packed with health benefits and gathered to help you get the most out of your day. Visit mr-tea.co.uk or Google Mr. T Luxury Teas to find us. Use offer code SURVIVE at checkout to receive 10% off any order you make. Welcome back, guys. It's the Top 10 chart here on HTS. Top 10 signs you've stumbled into a pagan cult. At 10, it's denial of the existence of a dead child. Up 2 and now down 1, it's 9. It's an obsession with animals of the English countryside. A new entry at 8, it's open mocking of Christianity. Fresh at 7, it's putting a dead animal in a child's grave. 
Making a comeback at six, it's a belief in reincarnation. At five, it's a group of naked women jumping over a bonfire. In at four, it's the gift of a virgin to a beautiful young woman. Knocked off the top spot at three, it's everyone in town telling you that they're literally in a pagan cult. Big in at two, it's everyone clearly practicing pagan rituals which end in sacrifice and telling you to watch out because they're going to practice a pagan ritual which end in sacrifice that very day. And your number one sign that you've stumbled across a pagan cult for this week is... Everyone in town having sex on the village green at supper time. Yeah? Yeah. Hard to argue with. I'm surprised that um, the new single from uh, Being Burned Alive in the Wicker Man uh, isn't uh, number one. <laughs> I think the game's afoot by then. <laughs> the game's afoot. <laughs> that means like there's an investigation on. <laughs> the, game's, the game's over. The game's ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the game's a wicker man. Yeah. Um, so here's a question for you. Yeah. And I'll start off the How to Survive chat with this. So we've seen Sergeant Howie, who is a prude, mm-hmm. uh, come out there and go like, everyone here is having sex, like right in front of me. Yeah. Now why doesn't he leave that instant? Just go like, fucking this is crazy shit. Well, because he's a policeman, first and foremost, before he's a prude. Well, like, surely that's enough to go back to the mainland and go, there's something crazy going on. Yeah, but on. there's, like, what is he going to do? Just go, oh, some people are having sex. That's illegal. Yeah, but, like, if you catch them in the act, probably. Mm. What's he going to do? Like, he doesn't have a camera. He can't document everyone's ne- uh, what everyone looks like. Do you think he's just never seen sex before? Probably, he's yeah. So he just thinks they're all just, like, being weird. No, he ju- he's probably just, like, that's why it freaks him out so much, because he's a little, you know, prude, as you said. The, the issue is... I think that, I mean, you always say this. It's one of your things. Stick to your morals. Now, why would you want to spend time among people who are clearly so morally abhorrent to you? Yeah, that's true. But he's, um, str- I think his strong moral compass is what, like, makes him so dogmatic in trying to solve the case, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like, but- he, he he's so desperate to solve the case because mm. he feels like it's a, you know, morally correct thing to do. Yeah, but he must realise that it's, it's more than enough for one man there. Like, he, he has to go back well, and get help. He has to go get back up. Yeah, I mean, um, we don't know how staffed the uh, Highland Scottish Police Department is. Mm. Presumably there's more than one man. Yeah. They have a plane. Yeah, um, that's true. I mean, surely they just must have one, though, like, to in order to keep the... Uh, you know, he- whatever they are. He- Hebridean Isles. Yeah, yeah. in in check. Because otherwise, how would they get there? As you say, it takes a week to get a boat out and back. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, any, I mean, uh, yeah, any, any thoughts from you? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, to counter that point, um, I would say to Howie, don't be so pious. Right. Because um, obviously the uh, one crucial scene is when uh, Willow tries to seduce him. And uh, if he'd had sex with Willow, with Willow, he would have lost his virginity and not been a suitable sacrifice. That's true. Um, and he, he clearly wants to, right? Yeah. Like, because he's, like, falling over in the bedroom, like, <laughs> like up against the door. Yeah. Um, and he has to, like, physically pull his hand away from the door handle. Like, you know, we've all we've all had moments of lust in our life, Jerry, yeah. I'm sure. But... I've never had to like physically pull my other <laughs> limbs away from like yeah. going somewhere. Well, you make out with a photo frame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like he he's he's clearly a man who needs to, you know, let off some steam, so to speak. And uh if he had done that, he would have survived because he would have no longer been a suitable sacrifice. Two two points though. One is he's engaged to be married, so he'd be cheating. Yeah. He's also we're fan- talking how to survive, though. Yeah, okay. But you, one of our podcast rules is don't break the motivations of the character. And he is motivated to be, like, the best Christian he can be. Yeah, yeah. So if he's going around shagging uh, Britt Eklund... But he's also clearly motivated to go and shag Britt Eklund. But he's not, is he? Not, not enough. His motivation is mm. more 
like yeah. be pious. But he's also motivated to not burn to death in a wicker man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I'm be, I'm being contrary. I do understand we understand where you're coming from. Yeah, um, it's a difficult one. I'm just pointing out that I mean, one sure. of their one of their key. Um, yeah. bullet points for their ideal sacrifices that he's a virgin. I'm sure had you or I been there in 1973 and had Britt Eklund been We're like... Sp- broken her in half, mate. <laughs> 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 oh, real, real Chris Morris coming through there. Uh, what were you going to say? Just like, I probably wouldn't have been like humping the wall. I'd have been like, well, if everyone here is having sex, <laughs> okay, yeah. like... It's fine. Yeah. Like, sounds like... It's the done thing, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. When maybe it'd maybe have gone in there and there's just like... He'd have had sex with her and then he'd been led into another room and inside there's like 300 policemen who all look exactly like him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think... Like, if he went to like... Baghdad on yeah. holiday, yeah. would he be going around going... Bowing to God? No, we don't well, pray seems, on our seems knees. Like, it seems like it, doesn't it? Because we only see him in one indigenous culture. Yeah. And that's his resp- response to it. Yeah. It's going fact, mad. In fact, in relation to that, don't be so judgmental of other cultures. Right. Because it seems his investigation is driven to some extent out of his repulsion for their culture. Like if he wasn't so offended by it, then he might have let them be and thought, you know... Some some sort of weird misunderstanding, and not ended up being killed. Right. Yeah, they are quite um quite obviously hiding something, aren't they? Yeah, but then as you say, he he seems to like take it quite personally, doesn't he? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would. Like he gets very personally invested, and I think part of that is because their culture is so mm. at odds with everything that he believes in. But if he wasn't being so pious, yeah, and if he wasn't so, like. Uh, intolerant of indigenous cultures, yeah, unfamiliar cultures, then he would have um, stood a better chance of surviving. Do you think if he'd gone, you know what, uh, when he when he landed, went to the harbour master and said, "Look, Mister Harbour Master, I'm all for free love. Um, mm. I love that stuff. Yeah, I think everyone should do it. But what I need is to find out what happened to this kid." Mm-hmm. And the guy had gone off. Oh, you're talking to him on my level now, and he'd been a bit more amiable, a bit more agreeable. Yeah, maybe he's quite he's quite standoffish from the start, isn't he? Yeah, it's because they're like, "Bring me a dinghy," and they're like, "Who are you?" I'm quite obviously a police <laughs> officer. <laughs> he's such a dick to everyone. Yeah, he's not a nice man, is he? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of, I mean, James Bond, he gets information by seducing people, doesn't he? Yeah, charming. Yeah, he'd have been straight in there with Willow. Yeah. And he'd have found out everything he needed to know. Yeah. Be, so your advice basically is be more like James Bond and less like. Yeah. Mary I mean, James Whitehouse. Bond has survived every film he's been in. Yeah, that's true. Whereas Howie has died in every, every single one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair how, point. How about you? Have you got any more thoughts? Yeah. Point for point for Howie again. I mean, the only the only one who dies. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't drink on the job. Right. So he sat there having a pint. He drinks whiskey at one point. He's just down in shots of whiskey. Mm-hmm. And that's bad, isn't it? Because number one, it impairs your judgment. Yeah. To be drunk all the time. Yeah, and if it you're... certainly wouldn't be right to for us to drink while we're uh, doing this. No, it? absolutely. Um, secondly, it's illegal. It's actually illegal. Uh, under the 1964 Licensing Act, licensees had a duty to refuse any kind of refreshment to a constable in uniform, unless with the permission of his superior officer. Maybe he's got permission. Well, you don't see that as an assumption. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that law has now been replaced by the 2003 Licensing Act, which contains no such rule. But, <coughs> nonetheless, this was set in 1973, which where this rule was in place. So, mm-hmm. not only is the pub landlord breaking the law... Older, it doesn't seem older. like the uh, the the attention to bylaws is particularly stringent on the, the Isle of Summerall. No, but old, old Howie should know that. Yeah, that's true. If he's living by the book. Yeah. Hypocrite, really. Well, that's, that's it, yeah. Like, he's so pious and... Uh, How lived in that? Yeah, but um, drinking on the job. Mm. Although, does he does he work 
like nine to five while he's on the island. He's in in uniform. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's, he's sat there drinking a pint, eating his beans. Yeah. And breaking Does he ever the change law. your clothes? No, he, he might have pajamas. Mm. But other than that, he just wears the same. Sleep, you can't imagine how he's sleeping naked, can you? No, probably wears a suit. Yeah. <laughs> a tweed suit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he sat there in his drinking in his uniform, drinking a pint. Yeah. That's gonna impair his judgment. And that makes when you know, what do you say of a of a, a drunk person? You could say I could be they're foolish. Yeah. They're acting foolish. Yeah. And may- that's one of the things that's counted against him in the end. Correct, yeah. He's a fool. True. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know why he's so worried as well, because um as we've we've made note, uh and in fact as how he says himself, he believes in uh, everlasting life. Yeah. So don't worry about burning to death in a wicker man because it doesn't matter, does it? If you believe in everlasting life, it's a moot point. Well, I think at the end, he, he's kind of resigned to it, isn't he? Saying like, oh, God. Yeah, but there's no peril to him. He's, he's like, he's, as he's being loaded up into the wicker man, he's like, I believe in the everlasting life as granted to us by our yeah. Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So don't worry about it. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, what are you moaning about then? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fine. It is fine. Yeah. Doesn't matter. He's got everlasting life. Yeah. So when he's going, it's like going up to Wolverine or something and going, "Oh, don't don't get shot." It's like he doesn't care. Yeah. He's got he's got like regenerative powers. It's like how he's got everlasting life. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I think he's more worried about like literally burning to death. Man, it doesn't matter. He's got everlasting life. What's the what's the issue? I don't I don't see what the issue is. On the one hand. Being burned. Well, he says he says his last prayer is, "Don't let me fall into the hands of my enemies." Yeah. So obviously he's worried at the point of about death. falling out of the wicker man into the into the <laughs> cult. <laughs> he's he's worried the wicker man's going to collapse and he's going to fall out into the hands of the enemy <laughs> into the hands of his enemies. So I think he means like he does huh? believe in everlasting <laughs> everlasting life, but. He's quite worried that he might end up in hell because he's a sinner. And well, he has been sinning. He's been drinking booze a weekend. Yeah. Uh, in uniform, yeah. which is <laughs> numero <laughs> uno in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your point? I say don't, don't worry about dying because you're going to survive because you've got everlasting life. <laughs> what is he so worried about when he's screaming at the end? Doesn't matter, mate. <laughs> Do you consider that to be survival? Though? He does. He believes in everlasting life, mate. Yeah. By his own standards, he's surviving. Yeah, and also by everyone in the movie standards, because they always say, we don't say dead around here. We say, like, is now a hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Get over it. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, Jesus Christ! Just get over it, mate. <laughs> Stop worrying about it. Fuck's sake. So my final point, Chris, is uh, is for yeah. Howie again. <laughs> Would you believe it? Yeah. Um, and that's just to be, be-, be a better negotiator. Okay. Right? Yeah. So like, he's kind of like, oh, please don't burn me. And they're like, well, you've, you've satisfied the four rules, which are that he's a fool, that he's king for the day, mm-hmm. that he's a virgin, and that he came there willingly. Yeah. Now, any smart negotiator would say, well, I came here willingly, but that was under false pretenses. And also, I did not come to this part of the island willingly. Yeah. I was literally carried here against my will. Yeah. So when they, like, when they wrote the, these gods wrote their scriptures, these old gods, did they say, when we say come here willingly, we mean come within a 12 square mile radius of this point. But also, isn't it like, he didn't really come there willingly, did he? He came there... He was he was Lure coerced yeah. by the um, the letter by the letter and also by the capitalist system in which he lives. Yeah, because he's doing it as a job. He's not doing that, you know, for the sake of exploration. No, that's true. He was yeah he was he's, satisfying he's there that. S- satisfying the terms of his employment. Yeah, and also in the final scene, he was tricked. He was led there. Yeah, unwillingly. Yeah, they like, had he known Realm was. Rowan was tricking him. Yeah. He would have fucking not gone. Booted her off the cliff. Yeah, he'd have gone, this is not right. I don't like it. That's what he'd have said. Yeah. 
Um, but he doesn't. He, he goes like, oh, fair cop. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, he's like, oh, I'm, you can't burn me because I'm a Christian. That's... Yeah. Christians have been burned famously in history. Yeah, uh, it's true. That's not a good line of defense. What is a good line of defense is to say your logic is badly flawed. Mm. Like you said earlier, if he'd had sex with Willow, that's an out. Yeah. Also saying I'm not willing is an out. Yeah. He doesn't at any point say that. So yeah, yeah it could have worked. Um, yeah. I mean, like, do you think to some extent it's a moot point because one, they probably would have burned him anyway. And two, I don't think that the gods are real. Right. Like, you know, when he says next year the crops will fail again and they'll, this time they'll burn you. Yeah. That might well happen. Might do. Um, yeah. But then maybe Summerall would be willing because he's not. Uh, do you think? Do you know. think he's an actual nutter or do you think he's a, you know, he, I, I wonder if he's got his head more screwed on because he lives in like a giant house. He's, he's a, a cult leader. Yeah. So he might know. Because there is a look on his face when Howie is saying they'll burn you next. There's sort of a look of like, you know, like he he knows deep down. Mm. Great acting by Sir Christopher Lee. Yeah. There you have it. The Wickerman. Yeah. Another another wooden performance. Yeah. Wicked. Certainly by Wicked us. performance that was. Yeah. Jungle is massive. Wicked, wicked. Yeah. We're on fire. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, with your thoughts on how to survive the Wicker Man. Let the right one in. Yeah. The original. Mm-hmm. Swag Scandi version. So yeah. we'll see you here next week yeah. uh, after you've left us a review on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Uh, five stars is the language of love. And we want to hear all your five star reviews. Yeah. Or we will burn you in a wicker, man. Yeah, seems fair. And uh, email address, as ever, is howtosurvivepod at gmail.com. Twitter is at howtosurvivepod. And Facebook is facebook.com forward slash howtosurvivepod. Yeah, get on all those things and follow us for hot updates. (laughs) That wasn't even a pun, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, they were red hot. Covering all the burning issues. Yep. Uh, So the thing is, we've used up all the puns now, so there's no big one to end on. Yeah. I was worried this might happen. Go on. There's no smoked out fires. Doesn't make sense. (laughs) (laughs) It's the best we're going to get. Oh, God! Oh, Jesus Christ!